Good afternoon, everyone. Here we are in Costa Rica at the Punta Mona Education Center and Permaculture Farm. And I'm gonna show you guys about the abundance of diversity that we're cultivating here, the practices we're using to grow food and cultivate these different plants that we consume here as food and medicine and like to enjoy and be in the presence of. I guess I'm just gonna start off directly with this vanilla plant here. Vanilla is an orchid, actually, and it grows epiphytically, grows on trees, it grows on trellises, as you can see here. And it is actually naturally pollinated here and it produces fruit that you then ferment into the vanilla pod. Yeah, let's keep going. We have Tulsi right here. We have actually at least three varieties, probably four varieties of Tulsi on the farm, uh, known as holy basil, uh, which is very, very important in Ayurvedic medicine. Another medicinal plant right here is verbena, which is commonly used in tropical regions of Central America as a nervine. We have these perennial chilies, we have a nopal cactus, which grows in arid regions, but it seems to be doing fine here in this tropical climate. We have pepper vines right behind on this trellis, made from a tree called Madera Negra. It's actually a living trellis. You can see the poles are actually shooting out new growth. This way the wood doesn't rot because it's actually alive. We have coca, which is traditionally from high altitude in the Andes, and it seems to be growing fine and liking the climate here. Of course, we have beautiful ornamental species like this torch ginger, which is, as the name entails, a ginger relative. We have egg fruit, this egg fruit. When you open it up, it produces this sweet flesh that is reminiscent of an egg yolk. And it's really good in a variety of desserts. Yeah, we have a lot of different things here. Some things we don't even use medicinally or for food, but we have things like this Mexican sunflower. We actually use this to produce biomass. So we put this on the edge of our gardens. These leaves are very rich in nitrogen. This is also known as a phosphorus accumulator, so it accumulates phosphorus. These are two of the most important nutrients for plants, most limited nutrients in soils. And what you can do with this is use it as a fertilizer. You chop it with a machete and you put it under a plant and it will decompose there and actually feed the microbes in the soil. Uh, so it's not something we eat, but it's something that we use to produce more food by, you know, companion planting and having it near our garden. So whenever we need to give our plants a little extra boost, we can feed the soil. Here we have go-to cola. It's one of my favorite herbs. It's considered a panacea in some sense, mostly known for stimulating focus and learning and brain enhancement. You could say moringa. You know, moringa, they say, has more vitamin C than oranges. It has more potassium than bananas, more calcium than milk more iron than red meat, more protein than meat. Uh, it's really an incredible plant. We also use this to make fertilizers as well. You chop off all the leaves and then you ferment them in water and you get an excellent liquid fertilizer. Pretty impressive. Here we have lemongrass. Lemongrass I pretty much drink every day. If you live with me here, you'll see pieces of lemongrass always sticking out from my mug. It's just an awesome tea that I drink every day for enjoyment, but also it's it has antioxidants, makes you feel good, it alleviates nausea. We have more perennial peppers. Here we have papayas. You can see we have this glove around this papaya. What the glove actually does is it's protecting it from a fly which lays its larva in the papaya. You can see in this case it might have not really worked because uh, when that fly lays its larva inside of the papaya, the papaya will actually fall and we can't really eat it. Uh, it's been an issue we've been having here, but we're trying to find ways to control it. Uh, another thing that we're trying to do, not exactly here, but you keep the area around the papaya clean just to not promote the larva's life cycle, which is partially in the soil. We have a cacao here, which before Punta Mona Center ever existed, there was a community of people that were living here farming cacao. It was a cash crop in this region for a long time. All of this area used to be a giant cacao farm. Here we have a giant taro. You know, sometimes we grow things just because we like them, you know? They just feel nice, they look nice. They're providing shade in the heat right now, as you can see. And it's really an impressive species. You can see this beautiful flower, uh, you know, it's a type of aeroid. And there's really special pollination that happens in these plants. I'm not gonna go too deep into it. We have this passion fruit relative that actually attracts many different pollinators, but we also use it as a chop and drop. This is peanut grass right here. 
Uh, and you can see the peanut grass just helps create a barrier for weeds. It takes up the soil and prevents other things from growing in between it. Whereas this is peanuts. Peanuts are really incredible because they flower and then they bury their flower underground and produce the peanuts below ground, which is a pretty unique style of reproduction. This is, some people would consider this a weed here. It grows by itself. We don't cultivate it. We maybe sometimes broadcast seed it, but this is actually an amaranth that occurs out here. And what I love to do with this is take the young tender shoots and you fry them up. One of my favorite grains out here. Um, yeah, let's continue through this way. Let's keep on moving here. We have a giant mango tree. It's providing a lot of shade. We have a tree house up there. Yeah, unfortunately for us, you know, this mango tree was planted. It grew to be really big, but it actually doesn't produce fruit in this region. But, you know, we keep it here. It's here for now and it's serving its purpose to create shade. It actually produces a lot of leaves and mango leaves work as an excellent mulch, uh, which is really important. When you're starting a permaculture farm or a permaculture project, one of the first things you're gonna wanna do is plant things that produce a lot of biomass because the biomass, the leaves, the wood, the branches will all break down and increase the soil fertility. Here we have a plant that uh, has grown, it grows like a weed, it has spread through all over the farm. It doesn't grow into the jungle, only in disturbed areas, it's called katuk and it's considered another superfood. It's full of protein and minerals and nutrients. And yeah, you can eat the leaves raw, you can cook them, they have a nice flavor. You can see there's some wild yams that are kind of just starting to pop up and grow, you know? This might have been planted a long time ago, harvested, little chunks of yam kind of stayed in the ground and the plant just continues living. We're not really managing it much, but that plant will continue living. Here you can see our classroom, so this is where we take people and we, you know, teach them about all this stuff. Yeah, beautiful environment. The ocean is right there. It, you know, really is a little piece of paradise. So now I'm gonna take you guys to a part of the farm we call the Back Rancho. First, I'm gonna tell you about this vine here. It's called ayahuasca and it's used traditionally in ceremony in many South American cultures. And we have this tunnel of it that we're gonna walk through. And you can see these wasps, you know, we've seen this nest here. We don't mess with it. They could be potentially painful, but you know, we coexist with them. If we don't mess with them, they're not gonna hurt us. Let's go. Here we are at the rancho. So this is where a lot of things for the farm itself, as far as construction takes place. Bamboo gets processed here, plenty of wood. So we're in the middle of a wildlife refuge. You're actually not allowed to chop down trees here, obviously, but when trees fall, you can harvest the wood on the property. So we process wood here and you know, all of the buildings that you see here are constructed from materials that come from the land around us. There's amazing artisanal work that happens here. A lot of the locals here are just amazing at crafting things. They have a very intimate relationship with this place and they do beautiful pieces of art. It's really an important part of this place is, you know, this knowledge that they have. Cool. So here we are at the back rancho. Uh, this is an area that has recently been retransformed. The first time I was here two years ago, you wouldn't even recognize this. It has been completely transformed into a very productive zone. And you can see right here, we're in an area that has just recently been started. My friend Spencer, who's behind the camera, is gonna tell you guys a little bit about what he's been doing out here and all the hard work. Okay, so this is the area that I've been working at with our other dear friend, Steve. This is a clump of bamboo that was a lot thicker than it is right now, just yesterday. We uh, halved it just for the vitality of the clump, making it look a lot nicer. And here it's a bit of a mess right now, but we shaved off all the leaves and we're gonna use all these combs for different things. As you can see over here, we've used one of the combs cut up for planters for when we germinate seeds and plant them in our bed. Little protection for our baby plants. This also, when it dries up, makes really great firewood in that it catches and makes really big flame. So we're gonna let that dry out. And then this big pile of leaves we'll use for mulch. We've been using for mulch. If you look over here, this is all mulch from the last time I trimmed the bamboo. It makes a really great path, great to walk on, and provides shade for some of the soil and uh, prevents weeds from popping up. 
Right here we have a guanabana tree surrounded by a bunch of Brazilian spinach. So this is uh, looking really healthy. We just planted it all like a week, week and a half ago. There's a few weeds that inevitably grow all over the place here. So in order to prevent against that, we use Brazilian spinach as a ground cover and uh, that'll hopefully take care of that and protect the, uh, the baby guanabana tree. Here we have my pride and joy. Some call it the Sydney Opera House. The fishtail trellis, a light beam. You can call it whatever you want. It's a trellis made by Steve and I. Pretty simple design. It's made from bamboo. Only about five or six strings. The rest of it is all held together with tension because we weave the bamboo in a way that it'll hold strong. So this bed is another thing that occurred in the past uh, month. So what this is is all pineapples. So we have five different beds and we planted somewhere over 100 pineapples in these beds. If you look closely, you can see that there's pineapples everywhere. We also planted a ground cover because it'll be hard to weed once those pineapples grow. When they get a little bit bigger, they you know, grow together and they're really spiky, so we don't wanna be reaching in there all the time. So in this bed, we planted some Brazilian spinach alongside the pineapples to grow and provide that ground cover. Um, in the other beds, we planted things like gotu cola. And as you can see also, there's several banana trees in this bed that will provide shade for the pineapples because the pineapples like to grow with a little bit of shade. We also have, like Timo mentioned earlier, some Mexican sunflower there, just planting biomass for mulch. Next stop, we just created these beds too. So this is a trellis built with Madera Negra posts. Uh, like Timo talked about earlier, these were branches from the Madera Negra tree and they will root down and then be able to become their own trees as they provide the poles for this trellis. We haven't planted anything in here yet, but we're planning to plant long yard beans. So they're beans that grow on a vine and we'll be able to harvest them right here. In this bed, we just planted cucumbers and this bed is unplanted so far. Continuing on, back here, there's another little strip of an island. We just put this trellis up yesterday. So this is a trellis that's built with three wires, simple design, also Madera Negra posts, and this is gonna grow Sacha Inchi. Yeah, so Sacha Inchi is an incredible nut that is originally from the Amazon rainforest. It will eventually grow up this trellis and it bears these fruit that have four or five seeds and these seeds are incredibly delicious and oily. Uh, in particular, they have all the omegas that you need and they create a lot of fruit. They're perennial. And yeah, it's another incredible plant that we have the joy of growing here. One of the most important things about cultivating in this region, you know, every climate is different. Obviously gardening and farming here is much different than farming in a northern temperate region or in an arid region. Here, one of the issues that we often have, particularly in the middle of the rainy season, is a lot, a lot of water. And one way that we manage this is through these drainage trenches and through ponds, as you can see over here. So essentially what we're doing is we're digging trenches that divert the water. And from the soil that we dig out of these trenches, we build raised beds. This protects the main root zone of the plants so it never gets waterlogged and roots the base of the plants. A lot of the plants we cultivate are kind of susceptible to this root rot. So we've dug out these trenches, used the soil to raise the land around. We have ponds that are all around the trench system that help collect water. Also during the dry season, they'll still have some water. You can go and put your watering can in there and have a very easy access to water. They're also very nice to swim and cool down in in the middle of the day while you're working. Uh, also host a lot of you know different organisms. Once the ponds get more developed and we put more plants in here, it's a place for dragonflies and butterflies and birds to come and bathe. And it produces a really nice feature for these gardens. Here we have one of my favorite plants, which is this perennial pepper plant. You might recognize these and think habanero, but this is actually a sweet habanero relative. We don't exactly know the common name. We call it the sweet Panamanian pepper because we have a habanero variety here that is known as the Panamanian pepper that is really spicy. And this grows very similarly, but it produces sweet peppers. As you can see, these plants are just full of peppers and they mature into this red color and then they continue growing for quite a while. Yeah, it's a really beautiful, beautiful plant to have. And we've been planting it in really large quantities recently. 
uh, because it's something that we love to eat and consume and munch on. Here you can see ayote, which is a type of pumpkin that is grown and cultivated and consumed in this area. Pumpkins can grow very aggressively out here. They become an amazing ground cover. It's a delicious thing that is cultivated out here. Here you can see a big patch of Mexican sunflower. Uh, these tarps that you see laying around, they look a little dirty. We haven't exactly cleaned up for this area, but we were actually pulling weeds and then roasting them in these tarps uh, by putting the tarps over them. The tarps heat up sometimes to over 180 degrees and it kills all the weeds. And then you can even use them as mulch like that. It's a pretty good system. Here you can see we have more peppers. We have Tulsi. We have a chayote which is another incredible plant that is consumed a lot in Latin America. And you know, we're just using this living tree as a trellis. Sometimes that can just be the easiest way to, you know, bring uh, these structures that a lot of the plants we consume naturally like. Here we have a wild Fasala species, sometimes known as Chinese lantern or ground cherry. Uh, it's related to the goldenberry. And yeah, it grows like a weed out here. It produces really small, but delicious fruit if you get them when they're ripe. Uh, here you can see one of the cabins that one of the community members lives in. It's really beautiful, made with bamboo. This is my favorite cabin on the property, a little more isolated from the central region. Here, I'm going to show you guys something that has recently been propagated in large quantities here at Punta Mona. It's this plant called vetiver. Uh, vetiver, we've planted around all of the trenches here because as you might even be able to see, there's a little bit of erosion that happens in these trenches naturally. And the vetiver grows really strong, deep roots that don't spread laterally too far. So they're not gonna disrupt the plants that are in this bed. It's not gonna spread out. Uh, it will grow bigger and bigger, but the other incredible thing is that it creates a beautiful mulch that doesn't break it down very quickly. And it makes for excellent paths. It's excellent on the beds and it produces a lot of biomass, uh, which is really good as I've been saying. The warm weather and the moist weather out here means that everything breaks down very, very quickly. And thus you need to continue adding things to your soil because if not, all of the organic matter in the soil will be eaten up by the microbes and the fungus and your soil will turn barren again. Tropical soils don't naturally accumulate organic matter like in a temperate region because of this quick nutrient cycling. Here you can see some rows that were built several years ago. We have golden berries, but kind of like the mango I spoke about earlier, they're not actually producing fruit even though they're growing. We have okra that's growing in between these rows of beans. You know, it's continually a process here of planting and then replanting because the plants, you know, don't live forever and they end up dying out. And if we don't replant before the other ones die out, then we end up with a shortage. And now as we're getting back into this back area, uh, you might, if you're familiar with the permaculture principles, call it like a zone four. It's an area that is not maintained or manicured as much because we're growing very, very hardy species such as bananas and plantains, uh, these papayas, yucca, which yucca is a really incredible, super productive uh, tuber that is grown. It's also known as cassava. This is an incredible plant that you can literally come to the plant and cut a branch. You would use a much bigger branch than this, but essentially you can repropagate this just by sticking it in the ground. You know, you do it, probably come out here with a shovel or something, but yeah, you know, if you leave this here, that's going to grow into another bush. Here we have yams that are growing on these trellises in between the bananas. Beautiful job here. That's all a uh, yucca forest in there. Uh, yeah, Santi, who's one of the locals, planted most of this stuff and he's done an incredible job planting this zone out. Now we're gonna move further back towards the center of the property and show you guys some other epic things that we're cultivating out here. <music> So this is a plant known as wax shambu. It's a tree, as you can see, and it produces these apple-like fruits in abundance. It'll fruit multiple times a year. They have this beautiful pink color. We actually have at least three varieties here on the farm, and they produce in very, very large quantities. One of the big things about growing this is when this plant produces, how are you actually gonna consume all of this fruit? 
Uh, so recently we've been processing a lot of wax shampoo, particularly into juice. The juice tastes a lot like apple juice, it's very sweet. We've also been fermenting it into wax champagne, which is more like a cider that we produce from it. And we've been making vinegar with it. It's a way to preserve this fruit for long periods of time. Let's continue moving on. So here's an area that hasn't necessarily been worked into a highly productive space. It's just a beautiful part on the farm. It's open. We have this beautiful heart pond here is what we call it. Uh, with hyacinths. The hyacinths, as you might know, are an aquatic species that are invasive in many parts of the world. They grow incredibly quick. Uh, obviously, they have all the water they need. They have all the sunlight they need. They have plenty of nutrients, so they don't really have much that's limiting their growth, and they just will take over. But for us, it's another source of biomass. It's also a place where frogs and insects like to hang out and lay their eggs and reproduce. One of the other most impressive and magnificent uh, beings that live here and have been living here for much longer than us are these birds that live up in this tree. Uh, they're known as the oropendula. There's actually two different species of oropendula that live on this tree, which is kind of an oddity. We have the Montezuma uh, oropendula and one that I believe is called the nuttail or a pendula. I think I have that name wrong, but there's two different species that live up here and they have beautiful songs. You can watch them routinely. They're a very beautiful bird to have in our presence. And they make these long nests that are just a joy to see and observe. Some people might be a little upset, especially a lot of the people that live around here don't really like them around their homes and their gardens because they, feed on the same fruits that we like to eat, but they're much better at getting at them. So they can kind of be a nuisance. Here you can see one of the nests that was hung on this tree. Yeah, you can see it's an incredible piece of art that is weaved with palm and sticks and different things. And these nests do an incredible job at not decomposing. It's an incredible material. And you know, there's so much that goes into making these nests that we have yet to understand. Um, they also make excellent planters. I like to use them as hanging planters, as you might see later in the video. Let's keep going. Cool, so here we have a grass that probably everyone that is watching this video consumes on the daily. You might have never seen the plant, but this is sugar cane. This is where sugar comes from. Uh, it produces these large stalks that are filled with a really, really sweet liquid that then gets harvested and processed into sugar. And you know, it's something that we consume here on the daily is sugar. And we haven't really planted large quantities of sugar cane until recently. Uh, but you can see we planted this whole area in hopes to help us with this sugar craving that we have. You can see this large bush of vetiver. Uh, this is pretty much about ready to be cut back and used as mulch. Another pumpkin here. Let's keep moving into this zone over here. You can see we have fruit trees planted all around. This is cinnamon. Cinnamon is actually an avocado relative. The leaves are slightly aromatic. We'll let this grow and it grows into a big tree that we have some over here. And then you cut it back and you harvest the bark and then it re-sprouts. Uh, this Mexican sunflower will be chopped down soon to amend these beds and it'll open up the light to this tree and actually cause it to burst in growth with the increased sunlight. Here we have another favorite plant that you're probably familiar with uh, under this cacao tree, sweet potato. Sweet potato, believe it or not, is related to morning glory. Anyone who's seen or cultivated morning glory might notice a resemblance in the leaves a little bit. These, you can propagate through the root itself, but you can also just propagate them through cutting by sticking them in the ground. One of the joys of living in such a wet place is that you can often just do vegetative cuttings directly into the ground and not worry too much about them if you plant them in the right season. Another one of the joys here that is a plant that is not really, people don't really know much about this plant in general, uh, Cleo serrata serrata, but it's our wild mustard. It's not in the mustard family, but it produces these pods that are spicy, kind of resemble wasabi, and we make a fake wasabi with it. And that's really delicious. Uh, great addition to different sauces, gives great flavor. Here you can see a mature cinnamon tree. When these trees get a little girthier and bigger, you just chop them back, and then they re-sprout 
through these shoots and then grow again. So it's a plant, you know, you see the tree and you cut down the tree, but the tree continues living. Even these little red cinnamon leaves are delicious. Here you can see many, many more pineapples. We love to consume pineapples here and our guests love farm pineapples. So we've really been doing quite an effort in planting large quantities of pineapples. Here you can see the young fruit. Many people have never seen a pineapple on the plant. This is what a pineapple looks like growing out of the plant. Pineapples are actually bromeliads, which are a group of plants that are traditionally seen on trees. You know, they grow on the branches of trees. This is a terrestrial epiphyte. There are many ways to propagate it. Arguably, some people will say that the best way is through these pups that get produced below the pineapple. And as many of you might know, you can also cut the top off and plant the top and then they will also make pups and yeah these are all different methods it's an incredible plant because every time you harvest the fruit you get a top with that top you will be able to then produce multiple multiple fruits so it's a plant that self-propagates itself we're entering a part of the garden we have called the zen garden you can see this passion flower we have passion flowers planted all through here in these trellises Eventually these trellises will all fill in and kind of create this barrier here. You can see this is a clove basil, extremely aromatic. I've spotted orchid bees, uh, euglossia, actually harvesting what I believe to be the resin off of the leaves of the plant. Beautiful thing. We've, you know, done an effort to ornament some of these posts with different, you know, epiphytes and bromeliads and things like that. Let's enter this. These beds are some of my favorite beds here that I helped design and have gone through many stages here. We did a similar thing with raising the beds to prevent too much water logging. And then this whole garden area drains into this pond where we can capture the water and use it for later. Another thing that is a struggle, this is a traditionally very, very wet area. And as you can see, there's these holes here that you, you see, I could keep going down, like it goes deep. And that's a crab hole. Uh, there's blue land crabs that are very abundant here and they're part of this natural ecosystem. They're part of the soil biology. They're actually turning the soil over, you know, many, many years. They're turning the soil. It allows water to actually drain down into the water table. Uh, so in some ways they help us, but they dig these holes all over the place. Oftentimes they'll also come and just chop your plants. They just come and cut the base of your plants. So what we do is we use these bamboo rings and these prevent the crabs from coming in and chopping them. Uh, when they're recently planted, we put a little roof on them as to prevent the sun from hitting the recent transplant. And then we put these stakes into the ground. Actually, I, I'm the only person that does this, but I put these stakes into the ground and that prevents the crab from growing beneath and messing with the main root zone. So these are actually deep into the ground and that prevents the crabs from going beneath and damaging it. It also helps support this cup so it doesn't tip over. It can also act as a support for the plants as they mature. This is a bird pepper actually. This is a wild pepper that grows in many parts of Central and Mesoamerica and the birds eat it. We don't ever harvest from them but it's a joy to see the birds come and eat their spicy peppers. I myself am a big fan of spicy peppers. Here we have a plant that is, uh, we have bigger patches of it on the farm, but it's one of my favorites. It's uh, cranberry hibiscus, and it's very, very purple. Uh, the anthocyanins in there, it's slightly sour. It reminds me of Jamaica, if you've ever tried the beverage Jamaica from the hibiscus flower. And yeah, we add this to our salads. It's another one that, well, as this gets bushy, it produces many branches that then you can stick in the ground and just propagate them. So we've propagated them in this line kind of as a border with a little bit of coleus, which is this beautiful little ornamental plant. And, you know, hopefully it'll grow in and add an aesthetic property to this place that is, you know, just beautiful to hang out in these gardens. We have a citrus tree here. Sometimes when trees fall in the jungle, some of their epiphytes come along with them. Obviously epiphytes are plants that grow on the trees. So I have some orchids that I found on the ground from, you know, fallen trees that I'm kind of just putting in here as a little orchid sanctuary. You can see the beauty of this area. These are some bermansia, the trumpet flowers that are going to be growing in. Next to the pond, you can see some corn, planted corn in a variety of ways here, but this is kind of just, we had some seed and we figured we would fill up this spot. So we planted this corn and it seems to be doing incredibly healthy. We have peanuts here, uh, you know, another ornamental turmeric that right now is kind of growing in with this fruit tree. So we'll probably remove this turmeric, but for now it's okay. The young 
fruit trees, especially these tropical fruit trees, they like the shade when they're young. And then as they've matured, you chop the shade back and they, you know, really take off. And then you can continue seeing here in this area, we have trenches and ponds that are helping drain. Um, and yeah, let's keep moving over here. So now I want to share this special tree with you guys. This is a breadfruit. The breadfruit is just a fantastic species that grows in tropical regions and it produces these fruit. As they continue maturing, they'll get bigger. Yeah, they'll become like around twice this size and they pretty much produce a bulk starch. You can cook these like potatoes and they're just delicious. They get crispy. We make breadfruit trip chips with them and yeah, they're really delicious. This tree you know, it's a perennial, obviously, and it just produces year after year, multiple times a year, constantly producing good food for our kitchen. And one of the best things about it is that as soon as it matures and it continues to ripen, it becomes soft, custardy, and sweet. So we use it for different sweet sauces, for pancakes, and yeah, it's just an incredible tree that produces for long periods of time. Really brings us joy. It's pretty common in uh, the Caribbean of Central America here. Uh, a lot of different recipes for it. It also produces a lot of leaf mulch that produces really big leaves that are good for suppressing weeds. So now we're gonna switch gears a little bit and I'm gonna share with you guys one of my biggest passions, which is soils and amending soils. And this is a revolutionary technology that we've been using at the farm. This is essentially at this point, it's a charcoal. Uh, me and some of the community members here made almost half a ton of this charcoal, which was pretty much made from wood that was no longer useful for uh, construction. And it was kind of just sitting around after a couple trees were chopped down and pruned. And the reason this charcoal is so important is because we can use it as an incredible soil amendment. Uh, as you might know, you can use charcoal for filtering water and that's because it has this incredible ability to absorb things from the environment. You might put charcoal in your fridge to absorb odors in your fridge. We put them in our compost toilets over here uh, to absorb odors and they absorb this nutrients and they don't let go of them easily, which means that they slowly get released into the soil. So what we do is we take that charcoal, we crush it up, and then we put it in a uh, liquid ferment. So I was talking about earlier about Moringa and the Mexican sunflower. You can actually ferment the vegetation into a liquid. Then you soak the charcoal in the liquid and then you get arguably one of the best soil amendments in the world because it slowly releases it into the soil. The nutrients doesn't get leached and best yet when the mulch and things decompose in your soil, they get absorbed by the biochar. So it continually keeps the fertility in these soils for a long time, especially in these tropical climates that are very rainy. So a lot of nutrients gets leached and organic matter breaks down quickly. Really incredible stuff. And it's going to really help the agricultural movement because it's really, I noticed after applying this directly onto plants, you just see them shine, become green, perk up and become happy. Uh, it's really a revolutionary thing. Biochar, I recommend you Google it if you're interested in this. Let's see if I can show you guys something. It has to be a little quiet and sneaky. Um, but there's actually a resident that lives in this section of the garden. Whoop, there it goes. See it right there. Don't worry, it'll come back. You can see nests here. Uh, let's not spend too much time here. We don't want to scare it too much. It's still waiting for us to leave, but you know, it'll be back. Now I think I'm going to take you to one of the final sections of this garden. Banana circles essentially are these pits that are dug in the ground uh, and bananas are planted in a circle around these pits. And then essentially what this is right here, this banana circle is full, but it is a biological waste dump. So whenever we are weeding from the garden or maybe raking up leaves that have different seeds that we don't want to put into our garden, we can put them in our banana circle. And what happens here is the leaf becomes smothered by other weeds and they slowly, slowly break down and they help produce very, very, very healthy bananas. And essentially, we can harvest the biomass from this waste pit 
in these bananas because these bananas are now a biomass that after we harvest the fruit, we can so, chop them down and nice. chop them up and we can amend our beds with these bananas. So we are getting rid of our weeds, processing them here into rich biomass and harvesting fruit from it all at the same time. We have these scattered throughout the gardens as a place where you can just throw your weeds. Sometimes it's not really convenient to wheelbarrow all the weeds to the compost area. So having a banana circle really is a great and efficient way to process all of your biological material. Oh, here we have uh, kefir lime and we can also see uh, our community member Frankie here. He's about to harvest some aki. The aki is a beautiful fruit, also native to tropical regions. It's the national fruit of Jamaica, and it produces this yellow brain-like fruit on the inside of these apple-shaped fruits. What's really interesting about this is that it's actually deadly poisonous until it opens up. Uh, but once it opens up, it's absolutely delicious. Frankie absolutely loves Aki. Anything you want to say about Aki? Uh, Aki, the fruit of Jamaica, uh, really brings you back to your roots. Classic dish, Aki and saltfish, a uh, real Jamaican dish. And this is uh, basically brain food, just full of fat, high contents of fat, and it's beautiful to cook with, has like an egg texture, unbelievable fruit. Yeah. Cool. This is our head chef here from Jamaica. <laughs> Yeah, it's good shit. Thank you, Frank. You're welcome. Now, here you can see some yucca that is fully matured. Uh, you know, just a month ago, these were all standing straight, but now as they've aged and they're just about ready to harvest, they start leaning over. And this is actually a yellow yucca. Extremely delicious. My favorite yucca. Here we have more sweet chilies. This is another banana circle that we removed the bananas from, but we're gonna plant more desirable species of banana here. Here I'm gonna show you guys one of the final systems and methods that we're using to cultivate here. It's not traditionally used in the tropics very much. This is actually a hugel mound. Uh, in hugel culture, essentially, this bed started out a pit that we filled with organic matter, banana stock, branches, wood, leaves, and then we covered that pit with soil. We were, you know, we had all this extra soil from digging out these trenches, and we filled up that organic matter with the soil. We then amended it with biochar and more green manure, so things like Mexican sunflower that we have growing all around the bed. And then we mulched it with leaves, and we planted corn and pumpkin and you can see this corn is incredibly happy here i mean how could you not be happy living next to the caribbean ocean and you can see the pumpkin is healthy and yeah these plants are really thriving corn really just took off in a matter of a couple of months it's grown to be extremely tall and very very healthy all of this mexican sunflower here we'll probably chop it pretty soon and amend it to the corn so it has plenty of nutrients to continue fruiting but yeah i think we're wrapping up to the end of our farm tour here. Uh, what better place to end than the beautiful ocean on this beautiful day. It's a crazy time out there right now uh, with this whole pandemic in the world and we all need to find things that inspire us, take time to learn, to educate ourselves, to gain a passion for this world, to really not forget about how lucky we are to exist and live here and be on this planet and have all the potential to work with the earth and not work against it. But when things kind of normalize, you know, you'll be ready, you'll be more prepared, you'll be more educated to grow and make a better life. Uh, yeah, so thank you guys. I hope you guys got a little joy out of this, a little inspiration. Much love to you all and have a wonderful day. Thank you guys. Mm -hmm.